Us on gallery view. Welcome everybody to Books and Bars. My name is Jeff Kamen. Um, if you've never been here before, I will put some instructions in the chat, but it's pretty easy. I basically ask that for the most part, you remain muted and then raise your hand. There's a little blue hand that you can raise. I will call on you, uh, lower your hand and unmute you, and then uh, make a comment or ask your question. Uh, I like to start with a little bit about the author. Now, we have read Ernest Klein before. In fact, <laughs> we have read Ready Player One for Books and Bars at three different events. Um, two of them were part of our normal, one time we do it in St. Paul, one time we do it in Minneapolis. And then we had a special request from Dangerous Man Brewing a little while back, right before the movie came out. And uh, we did it again with them. It was a lot of fun. And then we all went to see the movie um, with some free passes that the studio gave us. It was great. So uh, I was as surprised as anyone. I didn't know the sequel was really coming out and it was really kept under wraps. Uh, there were, I couldn't get any advanced copies of it or anything. Um, you know, there really wasn't much known about it. And it just, you know, it was announced and then there was a shortest of synopsis. And I was like, you know what? I love Ready Player One. Most of us did. I'm going to give it a shot anyway. I want to end this year big. I want to have a little happy holiday feeling. So that's why I picked it. Hopefully you guys liked it, but all opinions are welcome. Uh, let me tell you about Ernest Klein. If, if anyone uh, was watching the video just now that was on, you probably uh, know a lot about him already, but he is the number one New York Times bestselling novelist. He's a screenwriter, a father, and a full-time geek. He is the author of the novels Ready Player One and Armada and the co-screenwriter of the film ad adaptation of Ready Player One, which was directed by Steven Spielberg. Um, he was born March 29th, 1972 in Ashland, Ohio. And uh, I believe he lives in Austin area now, I think. Um, anyway, uh, who read the book and maybe just finished it and has a really fresh hot take? and they want to raise their hand and tell us what they thought of it uh, to kick us off tonight. Anybody, anybody? Our, our co-host tonight is Pete. I'm looking for Pete and I'm gonna make him our co-host. So he will also be able to help me with the chat and a call on people. Usually we have another conversation going on in there that we will reference too. So maybe Pete's not here so yet. So Pete's trying That's to right. log on right now, um, FYI. Okay. He's uh, in the room behind me, so okay, <laughs> I can vouch for Carolyn, that. <laughs> you know that, that part of being married is, um, one of the vows is uh, if your husband can't co-host, you have to. <laughs> so I- He's unable I or see unwilling you. to co-host. <laughs> I see you and I'm very excited to, that you're here. And uh, just in case, at least we have Carolyn O'Grady here. <laughs> so thank you, Carolyn. And hopefully yes. Pete will get in soon. Is there anything I can do to help him get in? Is he having uh, no, any issues? It, Yes, but I don't think it's on your end. <laughs> okay. All right. Good to know. Good to know. Don't want it to be on my end. So once again, I'm going to put uh, some instructions in the chat here. Uh, if no one else wants to raise their hand and start, uh, I'll tell you what I thought of it. I don't actually like to usually start with what I thought of it, though, because I don't want to sway the conversation in case you feel a different way. But, oh, Rebecca saved me. She doesn't want to hear what I thought. It's, she, she knows that that's just it's not a good thing. So, Rebecca. I'm calling on you. I'm lowering your hand. Please talk to us, Rebecca. Um, yes, I decided to reread Ready Player One it, it, just so that I, and it was a good thing because this kind of starts right off at the end of it. Um, and so I read both books in three days. And so I was walking around in the eighties for a while and um, I, it, it made me think how, again, how much I really loved Ready Player One. Ready Player Two was a little less successful, I think, in my in my book. It it he he tried to reach for the same things, I think, and you know uh, get them involved on a quest, get them you know uh, to be the underdogs again, and it it, it kind of sort of worked. Um, but I think at the end he also had to make a lot of compromises about. Um, uh, was his hero really going to be a bad guy? No, no. Okay, he's going to be. He's going to end up okay. Um, so there, I, I enjoyed it that much more because I just read Ready Player One and I was still in love with the characters. If I had read this without Ready Player One recently in my memory, I don't think I would have liked it even that much because um, they weren't 
all that. I mean, nobody, well, I, I, I don't want to say uh, was nicer, but <laughs> um, th th there was some corruption or some, you know, being rich and having no problems uh, that doesn't uh, make you as hungry, I guess. Um, I did love some of the hmm, conceptualized thinking he did about having this ship full of virtual copies of all of the people going off, you know, to save humanity, presumably, um, even if we're never going to be truly anything but uh, ones and zeros ever again. So I, I overall, I, I liked it. Uh, you know, I really enjoyed rereading the Ready, Ready Player One and Ready Player Two was a fine diversion. Okay, uh, thank you. You jumped um, to the end, which I am really interested in talking about, although I think I want to save it for a little bit before we delve into that that ending. Um, but let's let's go back to toward, towards the beginning. Yeah, it really it really does pick up right where uh, the last one left off, and it certainly helps to be familiar with that. Now, um, I have read and listened to Will Wheaton, and I was really excited to have Will Wheaton reading this again. So I did the same kind of like did both, and uh, it was great to have him return and find out that uh, Ernest Klein had always only ever wanted Will Wheaton to do it. So it was it was really nice to have that same voice guiding us guiding me through it again. And um, I'll tell you, one of my first reactions was uh, I, I was a little concerned that it was going to be sort of just the same thing. But I think what was interesting for me was how he seemed to address Klein seemed to address some of the criticisms of the first one, maybe didn't succeed completely in doing that, but I feel like he did address some of that. And, and when you say Rebecca, um, where whether he wanted to make the, the hero or the protagonist a bad guy or not, are you talking about, who are, who are you referring to when you say that? Well, I think bo uh, both, uh, what's his name? Halliday? Um, Halliday for yeah. sure. I mean, by turning yeah. Halliday into the person that they had to fight against, um, uh, that was a very interesting, you know, thing. And, but I, I really wasn't sure why they brought that other guy along, the you know, big baddie, just to kind of cement that he was on the bad side because he didn't really do much. But anyway, um, you mean Sorrento? Yes, Sorrento. Sorrento from the first one. Now I know, I know a little bit about that, and and uh, I love. I mean, I absolutely love Steven Spielberg. He's one of like the idols of my life. But uh, he read a draft of this and said to Ernie, he's like, my favorite character is barely in this. And it was Sorrento. And honestly, uh, I think uh, there's a little bit of Spielberg thinking, I like Ben Mendelsohn and the way he played Sorrento in the movie. And if I'm going to make, you know, Ready Player Two, I need Ben Mendelsohn and Sorrento back, uh, at least in some way. And so I don't know if he, if he, if he was not gonna be in it as much until Spielberg said that, but but Klein said that was like the one negative note that he got from Spielberg that then he maybe adjusted and added more Sorrento because Spielberg wanted it, which is kind of interesting that then maybe you didn't, yeah, and I don't know, he doesn't do as much. Uh, and I do think it's really interesting, so um, that Halliday, but it, it, it isn't the actual Halliday though. And I think this is what's kind of interesting about it because it's a copy, it's a copy of Halliday. Think about this. So it's it's a it's an online version living in zeros and ones of like Halliday up to a certain point. And it's like, so it's like this negative internet version of Halliday almost that is living in the oasis that becomes the bad guy. But I do think that Klein is trying to say, maybe don't meet your heroes or don't put these people on pedestals because they have flaws too. And maybe, maybe, um, you know, uh, maybe he put Halliday on too much of a pedestal and worshiped him too much and needs to see that, you know, he was obsessed. It was too much and need to bring him back down and back into the real world a little bit. Just a thought. A lot of hands up. I see Carolyn, my co-host, has her hand up. Carolyn, talk to us. Yes. Yeah. No, um, along with Rebecca, like I thought the book started so slowly. I mean, it was like 150 pages before we even got to like the action. You know, so much world building that he had to do. And half the time I was like, okay, is, you know, is um, 
uh, is, um, you know, our protagonist, is he the bad guy? Oh, okay, you know. Uh, so I was just, it was frustrating. And then, you know, the they got into the action, going to the seven worlds. And, uh, you know, I loved Planet Shermer. You know, I grew up, that's my era. And I loved uh, the afterworld, obviously. It was awesome. Um, but I was frustrated by some of the things. I loved, though, how he played with gender and non-binary characters. I thought that that was really a cool way to address it. Um, and I loved the ending. I loved the idea that you could have um, an AI replica of yourself that remembers everything you did, but then once you split, you're having two different lives. And so that must be weird to send emails to yourself. And, and you know, what are you doing? Like, oh, I'm in space. And what are you doing? <laughs> I have a child on the way. So I, the book was hot and cold for me. I ended up giving it four Goodreads stars because I liked the ending and I liked the gender, the play with gender, and I loved the prince, you know, planet. But um, I was frustrated by some of the other stuff. Thanks, Carolyn. Uh, I agree with you. Um bringing up the ending again, I, I will just say, I absolutely love the ending. The ending helped um, really, if you if you can end it in a way that leaves me, you know, thinking about those things and feeling that way, I feel like that, that goes a long way because sticking the landing, so to speak, or ending things can be really hard. You can really, really like something and like characters and then be kind of like, ah, oh, you know, well, that's the end, especially if you think this story might continue. And we maybe didn't think that after the first one. But then after its popularity and going on and then, you know, the movie, it maybe was inevitable that we would get a second one. And it's interesting that you say that there maybe needed to be, or there was too much world building because this is a world we should know already, right? And right. maybe to his credit, um, it wasn't the exact same. He did create like that next level. Uh, and so it's like, okay, it, it might be a little like, you know, kind of crazy that right away there's this second quest and there was this other tech that was hidden but the fact that it kind of more mirrors the way we're going and i feel like in the ways that you know um in 2011 or so whenever this uh, i'm trying to remember when it was first published um was kind of forward looking and we're kind of there to a certain point now i think some of the stuff that's talked about in this one with the tech and the the sensory the feeling of it the oni uh, is you know where we're headed and and it does create this new ethical dilemma that they deal with then like when they're talking about should we make it you know it shouldn't be 18 year olds that can do it or should it be 25 because your brain isn't fully formed yet you know it reminds me of like you know drinking laws or or being able to vote or going you know to to serve in the military for your country and stuff these sort of things like what if we put limitations on in that and um I don't know. I, I, I thought that was really interesting. Um, and so, yes, the ending, big thumbs up. Um, and uh, I agree with you. I mean, you know, it's right in my wheelhouse. I, I like that how he talked about um, some of these pop culture references, such as the Hughes and the Prince stuff, were actually not his favorites. He kind of covered like everything that was his favorite in the first book. And he tried to expand a little bit and to be like, okay, so if this is Kira's memory, if this is Kira's point of view, maybe, you know, what are some other things from that time? And I like how he actually also takes it a little farther and there's 90s, you know, there's a little more 90s stuff and we get a little deeper into Prince's catalog. And that's what I was really excited for everyone here, especially Minnesotans to read that whole Prince section. I could not believe, I was like, he must've spent some time here or really like what kind of research did he do? And I haven't heard that in all the interviews. Like what, how did he, cause, cause I have heard him he has been asked a few questions and hasn't known the answers on some of the Prince stuff. In fact, I beat him on his pop culture trivia quiz that uh, Trevor Noah gave him. I beat him on the Prince lyric because of course I knew the Prince lyric, but he didn't know this lyric from Darling Nikki. And he, he admitted, he's like, you know, I had to do the research on that. That wasn't necessarily my wheelhouse. I mean, I appreciated him, but uh, to go that in depth on it, that part really reminded me of like a Scott Pilgrim versus the world sort of thing. That sort of battle of like all the, all the Prince, uh, you know, the musician battle. I thought that was great. But I see Adam Jacobson has his hand up. Adam, I'm lowering your hand, unmuting you. Talk to us, Adam. Are you with us? Uh, yeah, I am. Uh, so the question is still what we thought of the book, right? That's, that's yeah, sure, sure. Um, and similar to uh, Rebecca, I read, I, I just binge read Ready Player One 
uh, right before Ready Player Two came out. Um, and I was super excited just to kind of be back in that universe. I thought it was really fun to be there. And, and um, rereading Ready Player One, I was like, yeah, this, this book was, was magic. And I think that it's really hard to recapture that magic in the, in the sequel. And I don't, I don't feel that um, I, I quite got there. It was just, I just really enjoyed being back in this, in this universe. And that was, that was really fun. Something I, 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 I really kind of liked in reading it in that way is, you know, the first book, it makes me feel, and they he even talks about this, how Wade is, the, is kind of like a superhero of sorts. He just has this like vast, vast catalog of knowledge and he utilizes it perfectly all the time. And in Ready Player Two, it's the complete opposite. He is just constantly relying on his friends to get him out of everything. And he largely just doesn't, isn't the big difference maker. And um I think that you were right when you say, you know, maybe they're making up for some of the things, some of the criticisms on the previous books. And he's really bringing to light, I think, the, the, um, a lot of the, the great things about people that his friends, his friends are. And, um, I think it, it does make up for some of that stuff. Uh, I enjoyed the book, but, um, I thought it was a nice little juxtaposition. At least that's what I read. Thanks. Um, yeah, you know, it, it is hard to recapture that magic. And, uh, and I would agree with Carolyn. I, I have seen, unfortunately, I've seen a lot of, a lot of negative reviews for it. Um, I don't know if, you know, if people just didn't want to get back into that world or what, but yeah, I, I wanted to be back with these characters and be back in that world. And I think, you know, that's part of it is if, if it's a place that you're, you're comfortable in and people you want to spend time with, that goes a long way with it. Um, it's certainly, you know, yeah, I, I don't think it's as magical as the first one, but uh, I, I absolutely enjoyed it. So, but thanks for your comments. And if you have anything else, please raise your hand again. I see Kevin has his hand up. Kevin, I'm lowering your hand and unmuting you. Talk to us. Are you with us, Kevin? Yep, I'm still muted. Um, so yeah, I, I think I'd agree with everyone so far who said that, um, that it's a step down from the first one. I didn't really like this one that much. Um, in general, I kind of found a lot of the pop culture references just sort of grating. Um, and there's always the problem where it's like, I'm reading a book with a lot of references that are reminding me about things that I just like more. So why don't I just put down this book and just read the things I already <laughs> like? Um, but yeah, I think it was, it was less, I think, I don't want to be too mean to it, but less exhausting to read through all the references this time. But I think where he kind of stumbled a lot was on sort of the, the big ideas stuff about like AI and consciousness that were kind of a little half baked for me um, that, yeah, he never really delivered on. So I didn't, yeah, a little, little bit of a step down, but I think, yeah, it was less tiring to read than the first one because I think he improved a lot in his actual prose. All right. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad it wasn't as tiring for you. So that actually sounds like there's some part of it that you like better than the first one. I'm interested if you have any uh, anything mm -hmm. you'd like to bring up about um, what maybe he was trying to say about AI that you feel he didn't quite get there, or if you have any comments on some of the the concepts or theories that are, mm -hmm. are thrown out here. Yeah. Well, like he brings up sort of the ethical question of whether these headsets should be used or not. And there was a discussion that kind of went in depth early on, but it just felt like the characters are just mouthpieces for each side of the debate. And then it gets essentially dropped for the whole middle section, which was kind of, I thought was kind of a fun adventure. Um, and then just sort of brought up right back again at the very, very end, and then it ended. Um, there was especially at the very end, there was like the, should we copy all of these people and send them on the Arcadia? Like that ethical question he even, poses it as an ethical question explicitly in the in the novel and that just kind of brushed aside all right um thanks i see larry pepper larry you have your hand up can i unmute you lower your hand talk to us larry i'm dana um Hi, dana. i loved the first book so much i've read it a couple of times and this one just didn't uh stand up I don't know. I, uh, I agree. It took a really long time to get into. I've never <clears throat> been a video game person. So it surprises me, I guess, how much I love the first book. But in the first book, I could really imagine, I could envision exactly what they were doing in those quests. And in this book, 
the, the level of detail was so overwhelming and I couldn't, I got so lost in it. I couldn't envision any of the, a lot of the things that they were doing, especially in the Lord of the Rings part. Um, I also really like dystopian books. And so I was missing that part that was in the first book, you know, about living in the stacks and, and what was that, that was like, so I, I miss that. Um, and I, I was a little stuck, it, the, the Minneapolis stuff was fun, but I was a little stuck that they went the wrong direction on 394 to get to, <laughs> to seven corners that bugged me. Um, and I liked the ending, but just in general, it didn't, uh, it was fun to be back with the characters. I wanted more of them. I think, I th also thought it would have been cool, I guess, if the low five would have played a bigger role in helping them. But um, yeah, just, it didn't, didn't do for me what the first one did. Yes, I almost, I almost wonder if at some point he might do uh, additional writing around the low five, like a spinoff sort of thing. I have heard that now he is talking about maybe the third um, chapter in this series won't necessarily be Ready Player Three, but might be like the origin story, which would go back to Wade, you know, pre and Halliday and like all stuff like before Ready Player One, sort of a prequel like episodes one, two, and three. We'll see. That, that's what he, he says he might do. He might do next. Yeah, um, yeah I, uh, I think that uh, it, when you bring up Tolkien and the, and the Lord of the Rings stuff, I mean, the similarity, and I, I haven't read that one. I have it right here. And it's like, you know, this is the book that he said, you know, nobody, nobody has really read it, but they pretend like they've read it. And he, for, I mean, he was a huge fan of some of his said his the first things that inspired him to be a storyteller to be a writer were um lord of the rings and then playing dungeons and dragons you know a real role-playing game where you're you know creating a story you're improvising you're you're you know you're writing your own story and he wanted to give credit to J.R.R. tolkien for basically being you know the inspiration for so much that has come after him you know and, and really wanted to go back to that and then to go to he forced himself to research, you know, his son Christopher's writings and, and really learns. And so he thought, okay, well, we've, we've covered, everyone has really learned a lot about Lord of the Rings, probably because of more recent movies and stuff. So what if I went to, you know, the Similarian and, and talked about that? Um, and I haven't read it yet, but it, it, you know, as you see, it's sitting right here. So uh, he was, he was really happy. It kind of, he gave himself again, another sort of assignment to, to delve deeper into a true inspiration and hero of his. Um, but I get it. If that section wasn't, you know, as big for you, for me, yeah, too, there's like, you know, those like kind of six main quests and, you know, maybe you have different favorites, you know, is it the John Hughes, the Prince, or did you like sort of the magic school bus education one? Or, you know, uh, maybe it's the, you know, the artist one, you know, there's a, a bunch of different options there. And, you know, it's, it sounds like a lot. I mean, I was thinking, you know, these things usually come in threes. I'm like, oh my gosh, we're gonna have seven, you know, of these. And the seventh one is more of just like putting all six together and then and the seventh thing comes out. But I love the dork slayer as a sword and then having to fight, fight him with the dork slayer. So that was a nice ending for me. I see Angela has her hand up. Angela, talk to us, please. I feel like I'm gonna go along with everybody else. I, I enjoyed reading it, I definitely did. And because of time constraints, I started reading it. And then when I was driving, I'd listen it to it on Audible. And so I had started the Audible a little while later. I'm like, why is this voice sound so familiar? And then at the end it was like, this is Will Wheaton. I'm like, oh, that's why. Um, and I thought he did a good job, but I do think, I thought it was really weird that he spent a lot of time on some areas and then the end kind of felt rushed in ways where mm -hmm. it was like, okay, well, you have to do all these things. So let me explain every piece of every movie from like uh, 16 Candles and all that. So it's been all this time explaining backstories and blah, blah. And then it felt like when they got into the Tolkien area, it was like, okay, you, it's like a two for one. We're not even gonna explain where these characters came from. And I don't know if it was because it's like, well, maybe fewer people are interested in fantasy so maybe we don't want to delve in much so I couldn't tell why they did that um and then at the very end I was kind of put off by they just went through all of this stuff but they were okay with suddenly creating more AIs so quickly it didn't seem like they vetted it out at all it was like oh well because Kira, uh, Kira's AI said it was okay 
it's gotta be okay. I'm like, mm, that seems really sketch. So, and it doesn't really adapt to the fact that I get why they put him on the ship and things like that. But they're still not fixing. That was the plan for like, how do we repopulate? And I know they kind of address it, but um, I don't know. I also feel like the beginning really went into all this stuff that never felt completed at the end. Like they went into all this detail for it to flop. They go into all of the experiences to get the shards and then they never come back to the beginning stuff about how they're going to make the world even better or anything like that. No, I think, I think they were hoping by sending the ship with the digital versions that that was, you know, their, you know, message in a bottle that there was, you know, that's going to help us long run. Like that's, you know, we're, we're putting that out there. And then, you know, with, with them being back together at the end that they are going to work on the problems at home, but that sending that out is like the, almost like the plan B in case it, it really doesn't work here, or we do, you know, have to then go where, you know, they find for us. I mean, when he's talked about writing the prequel, I actually would be really interested because of how much I did like the ending of seeing, take us, you know, take us to that next level then what happens, you know, what happens if they have to, if we have to leave earth and, um, you know, we colonize somewhere else with this ship of zeros and ones. Um, now, I know it wasn't the first to do it, but that that ending reminded me a bit of a couple of favorite pieces of pop culture from the last few years, which is uh, the show Black Mirror and the San Junipero episode. And also the, um, I forget the the name of it, but that Star Trek related one where they're, you know, living inside of the, of the simulation. Um, and uh, I, I know that you know many other writers have, have talked about this stuff before, but I couldn't help but thinking um, that those were sort of my modern touchstones for that. And so I don't know, I, I really did. I, I thought that that was their attempt at, at helping, but I hear what you're saying. There was a lot of stuff that was brought up and whether they really had time to address it or not, I don't know. I was actually surprised at how much they spent you know, in like the, the Prince section and the Prince battle. Like certain battles were fairly long and, and detailed. Um, I see Mora has her hand up, Mora. Are you still with us? Can I unmute you? Talk to us. Hi. Uh, <laughs> so I, I hated the first one. <laughs> um, I think because it was so hyped up and I am such a nerd and I was like, oh, I can't wait to like read about this stuff that I love. And it just felt like oh, I'm at a party and someone's like, you like Devo. And then they just talk at me for three hours about stuff. That I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, so I think I was pleasantly surprised by this one. I was nice. going, I'm going to hate it. It's going to be another like 300 pages of someone mansplaining stuff to me. <laughs> I already know. Um, and it wasn't as referential as the first I felt. Um, so I was mm -hmm. like, I found myself like staying up, especially during the print section. I was like, oh, it's not over yet. Like I have to be at work in four hours, but like I'll just read this one more chapter. Um, so I I thought compare, I mean, I still didn't love it. I wouldn't say it's like on my top books of, of the year, but com comparatively, I, I was pleasantly surprised. Um, I, could, I definitely could tell reading it. I was like, he knows nothing about Prince. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, all right. He like clearly, John Hughes, he did the research on John Hughes, but knows nothing about Prince. Something um, I thought was interesting was kind of talking about in a pandemic, how it allowed people to like physically touch each other and, yeah. and time together. And that like really resonated with me. Um, I'll, I'll leave with that as a talking point. I am going to send a YouTube clip of a, a joke like rejected theme song for Ready Player One that I that feel I feel sums up my feelings of Ernest Klein's writing. <laughs> okay, well, Maura, first of all, thank you. I, I, you know, I can't believe that someone who didn't like the first one that much would take the time to read the second I, one. And I'm glad that you, you were pleasantly surprised by it and, and are with us tonight. My favorite thing to do is to write scathing reviews of books. So my friends are like, why do you read all these books you hate? And I'm like, because writing the review brings me so much joy. So if I hate a book, I have to read it. <laughs> OK. Well, I, I hopefully you weren't able to write quite as scathing of a review as you thought you were going to write for this one, then. I'm glad that you that you sort of liked it. So thank you. 
And yes, I look forward to your link. Uh, I see uh, Pete O'Grady. He's with us. I'm unmuting him. Talk to us, Pete. I'm back. Hey, baby. <clears throat> Sorry. How yeah, you doing, the co-host? How you doing? The, the tech guy that can't log in. This is so. It's really fun. You know what? You know what? Your employer's not listening. Your employer's <laughs> not in this chat. It's okay. It's okay, Pete. Be yourself. <laughs> yeah. No. Talk it, to it, us, it's Pete. cool. Yeah. The. Um, <clears throat> Um, I'll say that um, uh, I'll mirror some of the other comments that uh, I think overall I liked it. it. It was it was it was worth my time. I'm glad I read it. Um, there's a lot of nuggets in there, but I think it's this book could have been a great book if there was more editing. I think the, I think the first third could have uh, benefited by. Uh, uh, more editing and and also they they belabored the the relationship with uh, 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 you know between uh, uh, Parzival and Artemis because the um, you mean at least the negative part and then it made the last third a lot more fun like as they were reconciling and that sort of thing but and then and I agree with all the stuff that Lohengrin she did like everything. She basically solved the biggest conceit in the entire uh, story. And yet, yeah, they got a billion dollars, but it was kind of like when they're bowing before the high five, and you know, it's like, well, you guys did it. You fixed this world. And and then, but I, I think this, the ending really finished cool because it also, it set up a lot more stories. I didn't think that was possible with this and they did a great job with that. I love the AI discussion because it's something I'm kind of passionate about. I, I advocated back like 20 years ago that AI, we should work out AI rights now before we have one. And just so they feel welcome when they show up rather than this yes. Westworld stuff from where we, we <laughs> yeah. torture them and abuse them and be horrible to them. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, they really landed on that um, the AIs are like us, except they're enhanced and they're, but um, the, the ones in this story, in this universe, they're, they have a moral compass. It's not like uh, this thing I grew up with, Project Colossus, where the AI was out to destroy the world. And another thing that is funny for, I'm sorry, because I know there's a lot of you that are, younger than me, but like I grew up, I played D&D &D with all the, the ancient modules that they referenced in this book. There's a lot of detail in there. I did read the Cimmerillion um, uh, when I was a teenager and it really meant a lot to us nerds who, who all read all the Lord of the, we, we had the tattered copies from the library and we all read them and all talked about them. And, um, and then a lot of our D&D &D adventures were based on that stuff. And, you know, early, you know, Nerd 1.0 was uh, uh, definitely got a lot of homage in, in this, but I definitely agree that the Tolkien thing, even though I knew everything they were talking about was tedious, it, 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 that could have been edited to something else too. And then the Prince stuff really cracked me up because we've been to Paisley Park and, and, it's, and it's kind of emotional to like some of us, uh, big Prince fans, like um, uh, he missed out, like the way he described Paisley Park is, you know, like even though they never did much inside, but it was, uh, you know, uh, there was there was a real opportunity there if he went there, but I'm, I'm glad he did. I, I love this shout out to Prince, but like, yeah, get, a, get, get hip with the geography. So, but overall, I, I loved where it finished because I think it sets up good stories. And that's, you know, those of us that read this stuff, we're just looking for good stories. So I, I hope he goes up. And it reminded me of, I put it in the chat, the, like Katniss um, in uh, the second book where uh, this one, where once he finally got to the big conflict, um, they had 12 hours to finish and it was like, whoa. And it was like, that was a big tear for me. This, this, this book was slow, slow, slow. And then just like, it was flying. So, and also the great 
I love the shout out to the LGBTQ community, like the, uh, the increase of empathy because people could experience what other people are experiencing. And uh, that, that, that meant a lot to me, you know, personally because of friends and stuff, but uh, yeah, just like, uh, uh, you know, uh, Star Trek Discovery this year just added a trans character and Star Trek's ahead of the curve too. And it'd be nice to um, see some evolution in this space for, um, you know, all, of, all, all, all people out there. You know, a lot of white men's stories. I'm not, I don't suffer. Well, That's I right. want everyone to get the story. Thanks, Pete. I'm glad you, I'm glad you bring up a couple points there. Uh, one of the you know, one of the things that really struck me was this idea of using the Oni as an empathy machine, uh, like that being one of the major pros for it. Uh, that really, this idea of this might be the first time that you can do that thing where you don't know someone until you walk a mile in their shoes, sort of saying. But that through the use of this, maybe this could be this more, um, you know, this empathy machine created for the world that would bring uh, people to greater understanding and, and closer together. And then the other thing being how uh, it could be used for people with, um, you know, different abilities or special abilities, you know, uh, you know, people who, um, you know, maybe couldn't, couldn't walk, you know, but then they could experience it again through this or people who, you know, they would never have been able to surf, but then, you know, now they're able to actually experience what it's like to to surf a wave that sort of a thing um and and yeah i do feel that uh that there was this like he opened he opened the the tent a bit larger and i think did try to address that this isn't just for i mean there was a little bit of that obviously with um you know with uh the the reveal in the first one of the of the character actually being you know uh, uh uh, an African-American woman, um, his best friend, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and, but I feel like there was, there was an attempt to, to try a little bit more, whether he succeeded or not. And I want to give him some props for that. Um, and I like that you said that, you know, what we really want is, you know, you almost sound like you're saying, um, we don't judge it as strictly, like we're okay with it in the sense of, you know, okay, yeah, it wasn't as good as the first one, but he points in a direction for future stories. And it sounds like you, Pete, would also be on board to read another one. It sounds like you would say that. I yeah. would too. Yeah, I've read all his books. I'd, re I'd read another. Um, I don't, um, uh, but I read a lot of books. But so that's, that's, that, that's not a glowing endorsement. It's an endorsement. It's a slow clap for Pete, though. <laughs> Pete reads a lot of books, everyone. Pete, how many books have you read this year? What's your Goodreads total? Oh, I don't, it's so busy. I don't even put them all on Goodreads. Um, I don't know. Oh, 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 there it is. There it is. He's beyond Goodreads, everybody. <laughs> Maybe. Goodreads challenge means nothing to Pete. He's so busy. He doesn't even put them on Goodreads. I love it. That's my new answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too busy for Goodreads. You know what? You're like, um, you're like one of the characters in Predator. I believe it was our former <laughs> governor. I ain't got time to bleed. <laughs> You ain't got time to mark. Yeah, well, your that was Jesse. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Jana and Paul. I can't wait to find out who you are, Jana or Paul. Talk to us, Jana or Paul. Jana Hi, Paul. this is Paul. Um, oh, I wanted Jana. Is Jana here? Uh, she, here. She, she's <laughs> over there. So. Okay. There we go. <laughs> so, um, uh, I guess kind of back a little bit um i thought this was you know that this was actually a lot like i don't know how many of you have seen hamilton but it's the like the second act of hamilton okay you've won the rev you've won the war and you've won the revolution now you gotta run the thing and um and that so how old is uh is remind wade's like 20 at the end of yeah. ready player one 19 or 20 and suddenly he goes from uh, being an orphan from Oklahoma City to being the equivalent of Jeff Bezos, the CEO and majority shareholder of the world's largest company. So, um, yeah, the first third, Peter was right that the first third of the book, it either needed an editor or that's a whole nother book in and of itself. You know, Wade 
the change from Wade the um, gamer to Wade the uh, massive C to the CEO of a massive company. So I, I feel like um, you, the or at least the first third needs to be understood in that frame framing because okay you've won it now it's your company what are you going to do with it mm -hmm. and um i feel like that was some you actually you kind of had to at least understand the that was the framework in which uh the book started and then i'll i'll admit i didn't grow up as a huge fan of prince so um kind of you know it was certainly neat to see all the minneapolis in the late 80s references um but uh um, you know it's just it was a little bit hard say I, I enjoyed reading it i didn't I, I didn't like it as much as i did on the first ready player one but um just the especially in the three big quests which was hughes prince and uh Sacrilean. so um it, it was just a little bit and then trying to crush all that into 12 hours um it was a little bit of uh you know, a little bit hard to kind of rect justify or reconcile all this detail and then suddenly having to crunch all of this. So, but I enjoyed it and uh, yeah, so that's kind of what I, my thoughts on the matter. Thanks. Yeah. I, yeah, there definitely is that, uh, you know, that first section of, uh, I mean, it, I was actually kind of surprised that the fact that it, it takes up right where we left off. Like I almost, I almost would have been more interested in let's see, let's see Wade five years from now, because I, I kept, I had to remind myself a couple of times. Oh yeah, this guy is only, yeah, they had it, you know, they restated that. And then the other fact is that, that he and, uh, and Artemis were only together for like a week, you know, I mean, they were, you know, and it was like, okay, so this is like your first love and it was really only a week and then you broke up and then you're pining for it. I was like, okay, I, I, I think I would have, uh, you know, maybe just me being older, but I would have maybe appreciated if we had a little bit of more time to see like a grown up, more grown up version of him and their relationship was longer and then maybe they broke up. And so they had more to deal with, but it was like, okay, they, you know, they were barely together. And then, you know, it, I don't know. It was, it was interesting. Then it's his journey of like, he's having all different kinds of Oni sex, you know, it was great. You know, he should because it's waited too long and he's, you know, he can't just be with one person forever. So, I mean, it, up, you know, it's, it's better for him to do that now and then he can end up with Artemis. So power to him. But yeah, it was, it was kind of surprising. It was, it was wild to think, oh yeah. Imagine if this person had, you know, we talk about, um, you know, this was, they had a, they had a, you know, he went from the stacks to being, you know, the most, famous rich person in the world and powerful person in a way and he's still only you know the the barely out of being a teenager that we saw years ago and uh it reminds me of this idea of you know like it, it takes your whole life to write your first book uh, until you finally do and then you don't have that much time to to make that to write that second book or to put out that second album and there's sometimes there's that sophomore slump and in, in some ways, maybe uh, Klein feeling that, maybe address a little bit of that with, if I, you know, do what, do what he's done before, put him back into a similar situation. Uh, but he, I think he was, he was wrestling with a lot of different things there and, and maybe he didn't have the time to fully do that and instead had to work it into, I have these, all of the quests that I still have to do. You know, there was like the scoreboard that was brought up, but the scoreboard didn't really need to be there. That really didn't come back. I thought, oh my gosh, are we going to get a bunch of other people he's competing with? But it really wasn't. It was just kind of a one v one sort of thing. But I see Rachel G's had her hand up for a while. Rachel G, I'm unmuting you. Talk to us. Well, first I need to start with I took your um, your holiday geek thing to uh, heart here, so I've got my like at awesome. at walker. Christmas sweaters. You got, got that going. Rachel, I have my my ugly Christmas sweater is a Spider-Man sweater. Nice. And uh and I wear it with pride at least once or twice a season. So uh but that is that is beautiful. I like it a lot. Um it's it's funny that you you just talked about that and I think Pete mentioned it in the comments too. Um I raised my hand just about to talk about 
maybe the Artemis and Wade relationship a little bit about how that was the most out of all this AI and things like that, that was the most unbelievable thing in the book to me was the fact that she would like like him after all of this. Like, <laughs> I, I mean, it's like they they had a crush on each other online for quite a while because they have similar interests. Great. They meet in person, you know, ecstatic at first. It's wonderful. And then, you know, after a week, you realize, hey, this dipshit doesn't have the same morals that I do, it turns out. And those are deeply ingrained morals that you can't change <laughs> and are very important to you. But, and so like, it, I don't remember, how long is it before the thing starts? Is it, it felt like like a year or something that he, or two or three that he's been looking for the shards or whatever, but. Yeah. I don't know, um, but whatever it is, but like, I mean, she has been fighting with him and realizing that their morals do not line up and that the things that she holds the deepest and important enough do not coincide, don't, don't go to get. So, I mean, the fact that like, once this craziness starts and, you know, and just takes him like having like one little meltdown and she's like, oh, poor thing. I guess I do love him still. You know, I was just, what? No, <laughs> this like, this is a deeply moral character. That was the most unbelievable thing that I, I mean, I, re I enjoyed that middle action. It was fun. At first I was like, oh God, another, another search again. I'm like, is this going to be retried? But I, I enjoyed it. It was fun. Very fun. But the, the relationship, oh, it felt like every other action movie where they try to cram in, you know, like, like the, the kiss at the end. And I'm like, why are these people even like each other? I don't even understand it. Like that's, that's what it felt like to me. It just like, every typical like old school action movie where they're, they've been fighting the whole time and then they just kiss at the end and everything's great because no it's not great it's not going to work well guys this is a terrible idea also i don't think that she would have been like seeing her grandma once is not going to turn her on to ai and like you know oh yeah i'm going to put on this headset that i've been against for like a decade and then like yeah and and send some copy of me that ooh, i just don't think she'd agree with that so I, maybe I identify with Artemis a little too much, but I, I, I found that to be completely unbelievable. And I know he's trying to add more perspectives into this book because I'm sure that was what some of the criticism was, but he, I don't think he got the female perspective very well because uh, she's not gonna, yeah, I don't think she's gonna turn around like that for Wade. But the, the, something I, I thought that I, okay, so one, I didn't want them together, but two, the, the other thing that I thought that I was disappointed didn't go further was the deep dive into like Wade becoming a bit of an evil criminal, <laughs> evil overlord for a while. And I just thought that like the minute the, the action ramped up, that was just lost and forgotten. And he never had any retribution for that really, besides overhearing someone say once as he's eavesdropping on people with his overlord abilities that oh yeah, he's kind of not a good person at heart. And so I, you know, that was like the one retribution and he's kind of sad about it for a second. But so I thought that they could have done more with that, like him growing with the, like the boss, you know, sudden fame, sudden fortune. Like, I just felt like there wasn't enough arc. It just kind of stopped and then boom. <laughs> and it, it, didn't, it didn't arc enough for me and solve itself enough for me too. But I mean, I, but I have to admit it's, that's what the appeal of this book is. That was the appeal of book one. It's, it was fun. It's just fun. And I like my husband is kind of, you know, he, he didn't, he calls them member berries from a South Park episode. I don't know, but he just, it's too much like, remember when, remember when, like he didn't like it that much because of that. But I mean, I just want to be entertained sometime. And I really enjoy like all the stuff that I like to do and, and reading about it. So it's, it's a fun thing, but oh, good God, that relationship was awful. So anyway, okay rant over <laughs> i'm done <laughs> no thanks rachel uh yeah i i think it's it's totally fair and if you don't buy that um you know that kira or that artemis would feel that way for him and that they should be together I, I get it um but i know what you're saying also about sometimes you know it's still enjoyable and you just i mean we get dinged a lot for um i should we don't, I do for the dark books I pick and the depressing stuff. So if I picked one that was fun and gave you some enjoyment, 
just That's before fun. the holidays. Yeah. I hope you got something from it. I like that it looks like you're working at a holiday record store. I know. <laughs> behind you. It's right our nice. records yes. with Christmas records. Uh, right here. I we like Bing Crosby, Muppet. the Muppets. That's some good stuff yeah. there. Yeah. That's, oh, yeah. Fantastic. Definitely. Fantastic. Definitely. Don't, that one. <laughs> are, you, are you playing the vinyl too and not just displaying it? There is a record player. I okay. promise. We're not just like hipsters Excellent. for show. We actually <laughs> play them. Very cool. Um, yeah, I uh, I think that um, it's, a, it's a fair criticism and I'd be interested to see what others think. I, we have a, a, a fresh Kevin and then we'll come back to Kevin Thompson. Kevin Matson hasn't spoken yet. So Kevin Matson, your turn, talk to us. Hi there, everybody. Yes. <laughs> so a couple of things on this book. Um, I did not love this book. Yeah, it sounds like, I mean, I'm probably in line with everybody else and then it was sort of a mixed, we have sort of a mixed review on this, but um, I was happy to visit the world. I like revisiting this world. I grew up in the eighties. Um, I played video games. I saw all these movies. So it's very pop culturally friendly. And I just thought the first book, the first book hit, the first book hit so many good notes. It was just a good story. It flowed well. And uh, to me, coming back to this one, um, it felt forced. I didn't hear anybody say this yet, but it felt like he was trying to force this book and force, force the quest and force things into this. Oh, we have to check these boxes. I have to find these pop culture references. And, I, and then this deep, deep, deep dive into them instead of uh, in the first book, Ready Player One, I thought it, it seemed like the flow was just better. Like there were just these light, these light touches on the on the reference and so i don't know if anybody else felt that way or thought that but um it was a fine read it was a good read i mean we're here in pandemic time and good to get through and i'm 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 not hating i'm not hating on the book i was happy to visit the world and i'm happy to i'm happy that he's doing well and i like the ideas behind it the prince stuff very cool of course very relevant to minneapolis and awesome so i don't i don't want to i mean i would probably give it like a three out of five but um because i didn't hate it but it just wasn't, it wasn't the first one uh, and it, it felt forced. So, uh, fair yeah. enough. Yeah, thanks for, uh, for reading it and for sharing uh, your comments on it. I, um, I do think that um, there, I don't know that it, it felt forced to me, but uh, you know, that I, I think I was concerned and wondering about, oh my gosh, another sort of quest. Like we, he's got to do this again and that's why I kind of said like, okay, if this was going to happen again, it might've been interesting if we had some time between the two, but imagine it's like in the history of sequels that kind of happened right after the other one ended, you know, it's like, you have to imagine all of that stuff. He, they had like a, you know, one week break of, of being in love. And then it was, you know, back at it, boom. I mean, practically, I mean, it takes a while for this quest to get going because it really, it's more of like exploring the Oni and this new technology and, and being like the, like the uh, Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, you know, type of, of character now, um, which I think is interesting. And, and there is, you know, a, a whole lot to talk about there, but thanks, thanks, for, uh, thanks for not hating on it. And at, and at least, uh, and at least being here, Kevin, because I know Kevin, Kevin is a tough one to please. We only see Kevin once or twice a year when I pick the right book. So uh, I just hope that in 2021, I can see Kevin more than two times. That's my goal. So I will. <laughs> All right, speaking of Kevin's, Kevin Thompson, and then we'll get to Tony Ninja Magic. Kevin Thompson, talk to us. Hey, um, so someone brought up, uh, again, I think another theme that kind of bugged me about the book too, was the idea that using VR and the Oni and Oasis and all that to sort of cure prejudices and bigotry, which I think it, it bugged me because Klein just sort of assumed that was obviously true, which it kind of isn't. Um, and uh, there's, I think another phrase that was brought up was the use of empathy machine for VR, yeah. which there's a great um, essay by uh, NYU professor Robert Yang about how much he hates that phrase um, when applied to VR machines. Uh, it's, it's called, if you walk in someone's, or yeah, if you walk in someone else's shoes, then you've taken their shoes. Um, and, and he sort of rails against this idea of VR being an empathy machine and how you're not necessarily 
made to feel empathetic for a person, um, you, you are tricking yourself into thinking that you've actually experienced what they've experienced. Uh, there's, there's a passage in it that I thought that, I, that I've always liked. It's, uh, first, let's get some other basic questions about VR empathy out of the way. How do you know this is actually empathy you're feeling? Do you really need to wear a VR headset in order to empathize with someone? Can't you just listen to them and believe them? You need to be entertained as well? Are you sure this isn't just about you? And I think that that sort of sums up a lot of my issues with Klein, just sort of assuming that 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 thing about VR is going to be this magical, magical cure-all for bigotry and everything that he thinks it is, that it's maybe going to just trick people into believing they're doing activism and not really. Fair enough. And I think it is one of the things that is that is um, debated amongst the amongst the uh, the main characters here because um, the world the the real world is so bad mm -hmm. and Artemis wants to spend more time in it and actually like boots on the ground like helping people mm -hmm. like really actually being in a place meeting people helping them getting to know them all that stuff and that's her technique whereas Wade's is more of like well no we're going to solve it through this way and and so I don't know that Klein is necessarily saying that Wade's way is the right way. I think I think what we see is, you know, there's a there's a compromise between Artemis and Wade, you know, for them to come together. And in some ways, you know, Wade is the one who has to learn that he's wrong, you know, that obviously things things don't go well for him. <laughs> um, and if he would have listened to Artemis, maybe it would have it would have gone better. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean. Uh, and I'm certainly not saying that uh, I didn't know a, a lot of this, uh, this talk about empathy machine being, you know, something else being debated. But I think that, uh, you know, if we keep walling ourselves off, you know, at a certain point, what is the connection? I mean, we've for this year now, this has been our connection, you know, we're so used to it now. It's like, I, I, I feel like, uh, it's interesting the pandemic stuff that was talked about here. I mean, I, I can't even imagine. I mean, I've, I haven't seen most of you in person. I don't even know how long, you know, some of you I've never seen in person. It's just weird. And then, I mean, most of my, the only people I see are the people that live in this house in person. That is other, other than neighbors, you know, and stuff like that. And it's not a great way to live. It's, it's not, it's not. Um, and, and this is without the benefit of the Oni. You know, I would love to be surfing right now. I don't even know how to surf. But uh, thank you. I see Tony has had his hand up for a while. And Tony, I'm going to let you speak. But I saw in the chat, and I want to remind my co-host to tell us what else I'm missing in the chat, that you have been playing some D&D &D online. And I want to tell everyone, before you get to tell your story, Tony, get ready. I have played D&D &D for the first time during the pandemic and i've also read lord of the rings for the first time during the pandemic so what did you do Tony? well well done no hold on what are you playing jeff <laughs> what am i playing yeah what character uh, class oh oh I, <laughs> you want to talk about this right now <laughs> let me let, let me save that towards the end see if we have time okay, okay. i'll even show you a picture um I, as as far as empathy uh, is concerned. I just want to quote the 86 classic soul man who, you know, they're like, well, you know, you, you found out what it's like to be black. And he's like, no, I could stop anytime I wanted to, which <laughs> was, you know, that's the whole, I don't think it really works with VR because you can just be done with it. You're like, ah, I'm not a woman anymore. It's good. Um, or whatever, you know, I'm just picking the most in the room here. So, um, I have to agree with Kevin, and I'd be interested to know from the people who just read Ready Player One, I almost didn't keep going in the book because the, the references to pop culture were so quick and so thick. And I was just like, I stopped even wanting to like look them up because I remember going through the first book and being like, oh, I got that. I got that. I got that. And this book, I was just like, oh, my God, you got to go somewhere. Just take me someplace. And I actually really started to like the book when he went somewhere. When, when all of a sudden, like a whole bunch of people were gonna die if they didn't figure this thing out. I was like, oh, thank 
you. You finally took it someplace. This is interesting now. Um, so it was it was fun, and I will finish it. You know, regardless that I kind of know the ending now. But uh, but it's I was actually just a tiny bit turned off by all of the you know pop culture references in it. Um, I kind of wanted him to dig more into the. I don't know. I don't know that I needed him to dig more into it, but I didn't need all of those. That's for sure. So, um, that's yeah. That's and and Tony, uh, what do you play as? Oh, I play a druid, and that was it, yeah. I got handed a druid because we needed we needed a healer, and nobody really knew what they were doing. So you kind of get the class that can do a little bit of everything, but doesn't do anything that well. So I'm a bit comic relief and a bit, let's keep everybody alive or at least keep the healer alive. So that's my, that's my role. It's fun. <laughs> um, I, uh, so <laughs> um, yeah, we are doing a thing where um, it's kind of fun. It's similar to this. It's a, the, the dungeon master is, you know, well, we're all online, but he, you know, he's, he's doing it online and he has a soundtrack on Spotify and he has certain songs and everything. And, uh, and we're using that roll 20 yeah. and I really wanted the first time to all be in person. And that was the goal, but then everything happened and, and we're, we ended up online and we, we actually, we got cut short. We've been on pause for a long time now, but if you must know, I have, uh, I have a wood elf monk who's named Ooh. Krajor. And, uh, and I think he's got a little bit of thieving tendencies also, even, you know, so um, he's got some martial arts action as a monk. So anyway, it's, it's kind of fun stuff. And we, uh, you know, it's cool. I mean, the guy, you know, this, this DM, he had us to come up like with pictures and everything. And, uh, and I don't know, it's just, it's wild. It is. It's like, you know, it reminds me of my improv days a little bit because, you know, the story is just being created amongst us. And it's it's just my my core group of like comic book friends guys that are also doing this, and it's kind of funny. We were all sort of shy at first when we started it because all of us had none of none of us had ever played before, and and we all wanted. So it was like imagine yeah four guys who had never played before but are all of a certain age, which is around. Uh, well, most of them are a little younger than me, but in the same range. And uh, it was wild. Um, so yeah, I, I look forward to getting back to that and also being able to do it in person. And I'd love to play with you sometime. Yeah, so, yeah. And I would love to play with Pete and anyone else that wants to find me on chat. I'm easy to find. So I see Kevin and Mora and Pete, and they've all spoken before. So Kevin, that's it. Talk to us again. I'm, o I'm only going to say a couple quick things, Jeff. There are many books you have picked that I have loved. I am not a hater. Uh, so <laughs> I need a new hater. I need a new hater anyway. So it's a, yeah. it's just a character you can play. So, you can be the online hater. No. Except like, you need to show up more. You can't just show up for the ones you like. I remember hanging out with you when we had the haters at the yes. book club. We had the, the old haters way at uh, at Brian Lake Bowl. This is like 15 years ago. 15 years ago I've been hanging out with you at Books and Bars. Yeah. And so I am not a hater and I'm not in that. You've had many good ones. We had beautiful ruins coming back around to Jess Walter, another right. pick you're making. I love that. The gargoyle was great. Raw shark texts. I mean, catch 22. I mean, we can go on and on, Jeff. I am not a hater. That's okay. all I want to say. Okay. I Kevin, to I, obviously you don't want to be the hater. Um, <laughs> I am, I am taking applications for the hater. If anyone wants to be it, it's a, it's kind of like, it's part true, but it's also like you're playing a little bit of a character. It's like your D&D &D character is the hater and your special power is to tell me that this was a bad pick, what you didn't like about it, to really just get negative and it helps spark the conversation. <laughs> it's okay. You know, Kevin doesn't want to do it and that's totally fine. So raise your hand if you want to be the hater and we can talk offline and I find someone. But, but Kevin, yes, you're right. And Kevin, it'll be 17 years, I think, yeah, 17 uh, yeah in february so wow. 2021 is 17 years of books and bars and uh yeah pretty impressive for any and you're one of the only people who was here 15 some years ago so so thank you for still yeah. being here 
and and I will I will uh, I will find a new role for you. It can be it can be the veteran something like the grizzled like veteran who's like yeah, 15 right. years ago. I like it. I like it. What it was like a Bryant Lake Bowl. You know, you could be the guy who's like talking about venues that aren't even open anymore. That'd be fun. But yeah, what well, we used to do it at. You know, it'd be great. That's your goal. That's your that's your. I like it. We're gonna set you up for that. All right, Mora, talk to us, Mora. I can be the new hater, and here's oh. my audition tape. <laughs> So far, uh, <laughs> you're the first applicant. I'm writing it down. I like the idea of, uh, of yep, of a nice, uh, of, yeah, I like it. I like it so far. Is that what you want, all you wanted to say? No, I've got okay. some, I've, I'm auditioning now. Here is my. <laughs> oh, here it comes. Oh, no, I got to prep for this. So back to the, the conversation about the empathy machine. I really resonated with that. Like, as a queer woman, I was reading these things, and I was like, okay, it's this white men. Thank you for the nod. We've been here playing D and D the whole time. Like, so glad you've recognized us um, and like brought us to your story for a bit. It's like, look at me. I watch the man on man porn. It's fine. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, cool. Thank you. That's like ultimate good boy. Um, so yeah, I felt like a bit of it was like almost tokenizing of like. Yep, I know what it is. Like, I've watched this, so I'm totally cool with it now. Um, I'm kind of getting into that. I also work in addictions and, like, throwing the idea of, like, I can experience a, like, heroin high. Um, and it's, like, totally fine because I don't have to overdose. And I'm, like, this feels like a very irresponsible way of, like, addressing addictions. Like, like it can be used as a harm. I was, and my brain went to like, yo, this could be used as a harm reduction method of like, oh, instead of like people can be safe and not have to worry about um, intravenous dis diseases and laced substances and overdoses. And it also is a little flippant of the struggles of addiction to be like, I'm going to sit here and get high and then like log off and be okay with it it's like that's not what it's about there's like more going on there so yeah I really felt that with the empathy machine was like okay it's a little bit of like lip service and like you're you're doing your best I, I hope it gets better in the next book <laughs> well I'm glad I'm glad you bring up uh, a couple of things there because I, I'm wondering about um what he was trying to say with um you know actual I mean, well, it's virtual drug use, not quite addiction, but he is, he is talking about, I think, a lot of obsession versus addiction as one of the themes in this book mm -hmm. and how the characters, you know, in Ready Player One, maybe it was more fun and it's almost like your pop culture obsession is what makes you a winner and you finally are rewarded. You have been this nerd and this geek and then you are now, you know, the big winner and you're the most famous, popular, you know, rich person in the world. And then this book is like, well, wait a minute. What if you basically, if it's gone too far, you know, and we see it like with Halliday and this idea of your, your obsession is maybe an addiction. And maybe you are spending way too much time talking about old pop culture, playing video games, all these things, and not interacting with other human beings and, and, and being in the real world. And, and then by touching on that of like, you know, he had family members or he knew, you know, these things. And so it's like it, it affected his mom and he wanted to feel what it felt like, but he could just log off and then it was okay. But there's this clear thing of like, if you're on this thing for more than 12 hours, it's, it's, it's like brain damaging, right? And so that becomes this race against time because they're trapped in there and, and they can't be on this thing. And so imagine if, you know, there were people that, that couldn't stop it, you know, that they went 13 hours or whatever, like what would happen to them? So there, I'm, I'm, if anyone else has any thoughts on what he's trying to say and, and, and if he is maybe, again, like this idea of, don't meet your idols or everyone has flaws and maybe too much pop culture and too much video games and too much online is actually a bad thing. And here are, you know, some other ways to see it. I see Pete's got his hand up and Pete, as I call on you, tell us what are we missing in the chat? What should we talk to everyone else about too? 
Talk to us. Okay. Please. Okay. Before yeah. Pete, before Pete unmutes oh. mutes himself uh, as his uh, spouse in the other room, yeah. <laughs> uh, one thing I did want to ask is, um, so you in the chat, Jeff Kamen, talked about the movie Metropolitan. I'd never seen it. Never heard of it. I don't know why. Tell so me why you know about you loved it, it. Do you know about well, it? Well, I googled it, but it's one of my what favorites. was in the book. Yeah. Tell yeah. me. I, w I was blown away that that was in the book because it doesn't seem to fit anything in there. It seemed to be the most obscure. I couldn't believe it. First of all, it's uh, it's 1990, I believe. And it's Whit Stillman is the writer director. Uh, he never got super famous or popular, but he does a certain style of film, which is um, it's very Jane Austen like. In fact, he did a Jane Austen movie with um, Kate Beckinsale was his, was his more recent film. And I got to see him speak and screen his movie at the Walker. And I just, I've always liked this filmmaker. Um, he's sort of in the vein of Noah Baumbach. Um, he's a precursor to Wes Anderson. He's very influenced by Woody Allen. I know that can be a, a tough name to say right now, um, but um, it's very talky, very smart people in New York. It's relationships, it's social manners, it's comedy, but it's not like gut buster funny it's more of like i get why that's funny <laughs> but it's it's dialogue it's and, and the movie metropolitan is great to watch this time of year because it's christmas in new york a bunch of people coming home from college and and then being back in the city and kind of hanging out in like they go to like debutante ball kind of thing and it's just it's really it, um the one actor you might recognize from a lot of his films is chris eigeman who has gone on to other stuff, but he's great in Kicking and Screaming, one of my all-time favorites by Noah Baumbach. Uh, but yeah, Metropolitan is just a, it's a talkie and it's kind of romantic and it's kind of Christmas and kind of New York, very New York. And um, that was his first movie. His second movie, Barcelona, is maybe my favorite of his films. Oh, he, right. yeah. yeah, he also did Last Days of Disco with Kate Beckinsale and Chloe Savini. Mm -hmm. So he ends up working with a lot of the same people after a certain time. Um, but yeah, I just could not believe because there's nothing like inherently, I don't know, there's nothing sci-fi or really geeky or anything about it. It was like, it's just a, a little low budget art film that would screen at like, you know, the Tribeca Film Festival. And I was like, well, how did this get referenced in here? This is awesome. Where so you know Barcelona? I, well, yeah, I mean, from like a million years ago, but not, but where, were, I don't know what was the reference in the book. Um, it's towards the, it's towards the, the start. I said, I think it's one of, um, I think it's one of Artemis's favorite movies that oh. she introduced him to, or it's one of Kira's. I'm trying to remember. I, you know, it's, one, it's probably one of Artemis's. Um, that makes sense. I don't have yeah. it right off the top of my head. I'll try to find it in my notes. If anyone remembers the, the Metropolitan reference, it definitely hit me. I, I usually write a page number next to my note for it. So I'll try to find it. Um, it was just, it was just like, it wasn't like he did a flick sync for, which is one of the questions I want to ask you. Because uh, I, I, I love that so much, that idea from the first book that's now used a lot in Princess Bride here. If you could flick sync yourself into any movie, what would, what, what would you flick sync? What movie would you want to act out? What movie would you want to play, basically? Uh, remember in the first one, he does war games. And this one, he, he's gone through Princess right. Bride a bunch of times. Yes. So, so think about that and let me know. Did you have anything else, Carolyn, before we go to your husband? No, no, thank you. <laughs> okay, but um, Metropolitan. So you you do know Bar Barcelona, you said, though? Yeah, from like forever ago, though. Like, you know, a million years or whatever. Okay. <laughs> I see. I have, I have Whit Stillman, exclamation point, Metropolitan, and then Artemis, and then Smith's. But right before, I don't know, I'll have to find it. I'll have to find it. But uh, it's just like, yeah, it's just like it's one of the characters' favorite movies. And I think, I, I, I have a feeling it was Artemis's and then, and then he, Wade watches it because of that. Jeff, page 77. Oh, um, it, did you, did you search it, it, it on Artemis your- Artemis and she still reenacted the film Metropolitan once or twice a month, usually in the middle of the night, probably yes. because you couldn't sleep and she didn't have anyone to talk to. Awesome. If you guys haven't seen it, I want you to watch Metropolitan and then um, help act it out with me. That'd be fun. But uh, tell me, tell me what you want to flick sync. I saw uh, Angela. Was your hand still up? I'm no? I'm wavering. Um, yeah. I was just there's a lot of commentary about just like the the brain damage portion and the just willingness to just let people go brain dead and be like, yeah, but it's not a problem. They, they signed the things away. 
And it, that definitely struck me a few times um, during the book that I was like, you know, I get that that's a big thing, but at the same time, you have billions of dollars and you don't want to get sued. And it just seems very greedy. The fact that he can offer a billion dollar reward to someone, but they don't want to help out families that may have been impacted. And the fact that people are so addicted to the point about addiction and stuff, people are hiding in their closets, less concerned about the fact that they're going to have brain damage later. And more concerned about the fact that they just really have to be in this virtual world because the real world is that either that bad or that they're that addicted to it. And that really, um, as I'm reading all of the chat things that are saying, oh yeah, they, they signed this waiver, but that seems to be a genuine thing where it's like, well, I mean, it happens. And towards the end, they're like, well, not many people ended up impacted by this. I'm like, what's your not many people compared to millions of people? So. Okay, to be clear, do you feel that the do you feel that our our main protagonists were flippant and not caring about what happened to the people? Yeah, it seemed very much like, well, we're rich and we want to help the world, but we don't necessarily want to hand over cash to people who have maybe gone brain dead by using this ONI and we just really want to protect our profits. Hmm. Okay. I I, I don't, well, okay. I don't know if I read it that way that they, I think that they actually, were, I mean, they were really concerned about saving the world and making sure that people weren't trapped in this and making that happen. Um, they see it, they, they seemed worried about the people, but not as worried about saving their money. Okay. Like Fair they're enough. like, we still want to push this out here. We can see the benefits, but I don't know. It didn't feel like if someone, were to have brain damage that they were too concerned about it. Thanks, Angela. Pete, uh, you didn't get a chance. Pete, is there something else that you that you wanted to throw out there or anything from the chat? Oh, yeah, I know it was um, um, Angela, great comment. I, I really appreciate that because it it's a lot of these the, the I I thought of some of this as a allegory on the tech wizards on, you know, it's like uh, how much personal responsibility does Zuckerberg take for what he does, and uh, and what is um, what do any of them, uh, uh, one of these newly minted oligarchs, take? And I think they, I think the book brought that out nicely, and I that's why I thought it would be a good book club discussion, because the uh, what is what is the level of responsibility for these people, and I hold them. To account personally, I I don't, you know, we just barely skated through an election, uh, and I I don't uh, I don't want I want my vote to count, and I want all of your votes to count, and uh, there's people that actually don't want it, and I mean not not to get into that subject per se, but I mean, the book dances on it exactly the way Angela just pointed out, is that there's a moral responsibility for people who have a big thing. And my comment was so banal, that's gonna be funny right now, is because like, a reference to Christy McNichol. I mean, I, <laughs> uh, you know, she was the same age as me growing up and I was like, oh my God, she's, she's everywhere. And then, but like, and celebrity was very difficult on her. And I, um, uh, and, and maybe that plays into this book too, because, uh, you know, the high five had got elevated uh, suddenly to this celebrity status. And, and maybe it's something like that. But I, I think it's like, uh, um, Evelyn, uh, or, Samantha is, uh, you know, the person with a moral compass, and and I put that in the chat too. Is I hope this is popular with teenage boys, and they might learn that, uh, you know, you should just listen to women. Maybe I've got. It. I'm still learning that lesson. Someone's teaching me, <laughs> but the, uh, um, but you, you, it really is the most important thing is that like, I, I love that it was included in the book and it's, uh, we haven't talked about it much and I'd like to hear what other people think, but it's uh, listening and hearing 
uh, others and in a world where you don't, it doesn't happen. Thanks, Pete. Uh, anyone have any thoughts on that? Anyone want to speak to his comment? I mean, I can go back to his wife, Carolyn, to see if does he listen? Does he does he listen to women, Carolyn? I'm, talk to us. We we've, we've been together, you know, twenty three years. We've been married twenty. You know, we're awesome. working. We're getting there. We're getting there. <laughs> hey, that's fantastic. My wife and I have been I married uh, twenty years, and we've been together for like twenty five. So well, you win. Uh, you know why it's not a contest but if it was I would be on the scoreboard you would win just yes, a little right. bit higher <laughs> yeah. yeah and uh yeah, yeah and I'd be uh you'd be trapped in my empathy machine and <laughs> and the fine print would say that I make all the money and then the hater would come in and and so our hater our new hater Maura McGarry says that she would flick sync mid-samar and I think that that's a great choice, but I need to know which character you want to be in Midsommar, because that can go in some different ways. I mean, definitely, Danny. I would just like want to wear that flower cape for the okay. rest of my life. <laughs> uh, that was a leader, maybe the leader woman. She was pretty cool. Yeah, a wild one. Um, Anyone else have any other flick syncs that they uh, that they would want to play in? Also wondering if if you listen to the soundtrack, whether it was Ernest Klein's official one or uh, there are some other um, uh, fan made ones. I listened to a fan made one that had a lot more songs um, than what Ernest put in his. But unfortunately, I ended up listening to an entire Halloween album that I <laughs> would have been fine with just like one track representing that. But the Halloween reference is somehow I was like, I am listening to an entire Halloween album. And those songs are like seven and a half minutes long and about three and a half minutes is a guitar solo. Um, it was a, it was an interesting journey that I took um, listening to that playlist. But uh, so Jeff Rebecca, yeah. Oh, uh, so did you find these on Spotify? Is that where you found the Yeah, they're on playlist? Spotify. I posted the I posted Klein's actual one, uh, his official one in the on our Facebook uh, invite or Facebook event for this and I think on our Facebook page. Um, but I can post the other uh, fan made one if you want the entire Halloween album. I can do that too. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. But yeah, the, it, it's good. I mean, I mean, the, there's some great songs in there. It's, a, it's uh, again, another great soundtrack, which reminds me, Rebecca Moss and I were speaking earlier today. And was anyone other than Rebecca a part of the um, mix CD exchange that we did a few holidays back at Books and Bars? Well, we had an idea to, because uh, no one is really exchanging mixed CDs or tapes anymore, but maybe you make a playlist online. So if you make a year-end playlist or a holiday playlist or something, or you just make playlists that you want to share, um, I'll share mine. You share yours. It, it, inspired by, by this book and by things we've done in the past. Um, I have a year-end list if anyone wants it. I also make a holiday mix um, and there's their playlist on Spotify. So if you're interested, I can share those. I'd love to see what you guys are listening to if you want to share, especially if you make sort of like your best of the year mix. I love that kind of stuff because um, I, I always get introduced to something new. So um, you have to forgive me for how much Taylor Swift or Miley Cyrus might be on my, not Miley, um, but yeah, but Taylor Swift on mine, but uh, she deserves it this year, people. She got us through the pandemic. Three, three albums. I mean, one of them was live, but good stuff. I mean, she's working with the National. Come on. All right. So uh, what else haven't we touched on? Anyone else have anything they want to talk about uh, with Ready Player Two and Ernest Klein? I'm really excited for our, uh, for our next book in January. I see Kevin, and, Kevin Thompson. Talk to us. Uh, I think I'll round out my comments with a, a compliment to Ernest Klein. I think there's, there's a lot of uh, AI and what makes it conscious and like at what point do a series of instructions become a real person? And I think he cleverly sidestepped a lot of those questions by just making his AI be like infinite computing power, infinite storage space and perfect copies of actual human brains. So he didn't actually have to go into the weeds and all that. So I think that was a clever sort of, um, clever sort of workaround from him to, to avoid having to get into the weeds with all those questions very, very quickly, because a lot of it was resolved right at the end. Um, so I think that was a good, good move on his part. 
um, with regard to like the themes and big ideas. Thanks, Kevin. Glad you like that. I agree. Um, so uh, we, we're back January. Uh, the first book of January is called Magpie Murders by Anthony Horowitz. It is a mystery in a mystery. Uh, it's set in the publishing world. Uh, and there is a famous series of mystery novels. Uh, and you get the, the mystery of that novel. And then you get the publisher's mystery outside of that novel. It's really interesting, really clever. And I believe it will be turned into a mini series by Masterpiece PBS coming out later in 2021. So read it now. The sequel just came out um, and it's called Moonlight something, but Meg by Murders, January 6th. January 20th, The Hotel New Hampshire by John Irving. Bit of a classic. Uh, February 10th is The Stars and the Blackness Between Us by local author Junata Petrus that is with the library as part of uh, their program. Uh, February 24th, one of our old favorites, Frederick Bachman with Anxious People. Uh, and the great thing about that one is any of you audio book listeners, uh, my favorite audiobook reader from last year, the one who read Nothing to See Here uh, is back to read Anxious People, Marin Ireland. Uh, fantastic reading on that one. March 10th, The Chain by Adrian McKinty. And that is actually going to be a film by Edgar Wright at some point in his career. We don't know when, but he's got the rights. And then our other favorite, Jess Walter with The Cold Millions. Uh, last we read Beautiful Ruins by Jess Walter. That's March 24th. So we have uh, two for January, two for February, two for March. We're continuing with twice a month, at least through uh, the time that we can see each other in person. I'm imagining we'll be twice a month, at least through April or May. And then my goal is, if it's safe that we see each other in person in the summer, we'll see, hopefully. Uh, thank you guys so much. I hope you have a very happy holiday season. I appreciate uh, the tips that you've shared. I appreciate uh, all of you just taking your time and really um, sharing all of your perspectives with us. It's been quite a year. I can't believe we're at the end of this year, finally. And uh, I'm feeling positive about 21. I hope you guys are too. I'm looking forward. We have a lot of great stuff planned. And I know that one of the things I have planned is to still, still see as many of you that want to um, online twice a month. So thanks a lot. Happy New Year. See you guys soon. Bye. Bye, Jeff. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you.